My name is Elsabet. Uh, I'm the membership coordinator in the Phase in Vogue Coalition, We're standing together. Um, I'll be chairing the webinar this morning. So really warmly welcome to our webinar. We're so excited. There's so much to discuss and we have fantastic speakers. So I hope you'll have a fantastic morning. Uh, a few more into uh, housekeeping. We have BSL interpreters, Nikki and Danny. So you will see them signing. Uh, that would be really nice. Um, and to go, you know, the workshop to go smoothly, if you can mute yourself, that would be helpful. And you're doing it now. So please keep on uh, putting introduction in, in the chat. So we will know who's, you know, joining us this morning. Uh, and also, please don't forget to post your questions in the Q&A. So later on, when we have our question and answer sessions, we can go through them. Uh, and Enjoy the webinar and welcome. And our first speaker will be Asifa. Asifa Usmani is our program manager in the Facebook and Work Coalition. Uh, her background is literature and human rights. And that's why <clears throat> she likes poetry. She loves poetry so much. And she uses it to address, uh, she's so passionate, so to raise awareness uh, on issues. And Asifa will give us a brief highlight of who Phase and Work Coalition is and why we are organizing this webinar. Thank you, Evelyn. Um, as well, over to you. Thank you so much, Elsa. Um, a very warm welcome to everyone. Really delighted and privileged that we are having this discussion uh, around practical perspectives on decolonization in Vogue sector. Um, before I provide a brief history and go about um, giving information about faith and Vogue relation, I would like to start by sharing what I read some time ago. And for me, that really resonates with the making of faith and Vogue relation and more partnerships and initiatives, which are much needed in the Vogue sector. Um, Native Americans had a planting technique where they would plant corn, bean, and squash crops very close to each other. The corn provides structure for the beans to climb. The beans uh, give nitrogen to the soil and the squash spreads on the ground to prevent weeds from growing. These companion crops were known as the three sisters. This analogy is important when we think about the values of solidarity, having allies, anchoring, and what we can create when nurturing seeds of new ideas and projects, which are much needed in pursuing path of gender justice, changing narratives, fighting against abuses, as well as standing up against structural barriers and racism. This leads me to the brief history of faith and woke relation. In 2016, um, Safety Across Faith and Ethnic Communities project was set up with Standing Together to build the capacity of voluntary and informal networks within faith and black and minoritized communities to respond to domestic abuse and faith and vogue safely and appropriately in order to amplify the voices of minoritized women in policy discussions. The role of communities and the work they do is an important component of coordinated community response, CCR. Community-based work, an important component is often missed missed out sadly, often chronically underfunded or completely ignored in the Vogue sector and commissioning. The SAFE coordinator engaged and built trust and raised awareness within Vogue sector, as well as with faith and community sector. In 2018, SAFE uh, hosted a conference uh, highlighting the role of faith and community in responding to Vogue. The overwhelming response and turnout for the conference and the positive feedback really suggested the need for professional as well as strategic space where faith specialists and professionals working with faith and cultural contexts can come together. The faith and coalitions was formed as a response to this need. The first meeting of the coalition took place in 2019 and the faith and war coalition was formally launched in March, 2020. Our founding members include feminists like Huda Jawed, who was working as safe coordinator at Standing Together, Muslim Youth Helpline, Respect, Jewish Women's Aid, Restored, Latin Women and uh, Women's Rights Service, Forward, and activists Sarah Hyde, Natalie Collins, and Nikki Dylan Keynes. These feminists emphasize the concept of faithful feminists and highlighted the key issues often ignored that many survivors of faith feel that some specialist organization and society in general 
are unable to understand their experiences of abuse and their barriers to accessing support due to their religious identity, their faith and spiritual abuse that they may experience at the hands of perpetrator. And that's why the coalition is really necessary because we seek to build bridges between members of faith communities or faith-centric organizations and domestic abuse specialist organization within violence against women and girls sector. There was a need for a professional and strategic space to allow regular and structural approach to tackling violence against women and girls. And just a bit of highlighting about the work we've done, quite fairly new though, we work alongside with other organizations to advocate for women and girls from faith-based black and minoritized communities and highlight their voices, provide training for organization both in faith communities and violence against women and girls, consult and give guidance on policy to policy makers and produce policy briefing. Uh, and again, though fairly new, uh, new as a coalition and despite challenges, we are proud to have expanded our membership. We are fostering connections and collaborations and going from strength to strength. Uh, and uh, I'm really thankful to the team we have and the membership coordinator um, for Faith and Vogue uh, and our Vogue co coordinator Zahra as well to uh, have been doing the work and being behind uh, and in supporting me as well. We also recently launched Experts by Experience panel. And with our exp experts, we endeavor to learn and listen and embed their voices in our work. And just a little bit about the work so far, the major highlights. In 2021, Faith and War Coalition were mentioned in the House of Lords and referenced in the domestic abuse chapter on faith and spiritual abuse. The work which coalition contributed and the responses given to Home Office with regards to the statutory guidance to domestic abuse bill was quite positive. And as a result, uh, faith related abuses explained in the Domestic Abuse Act and highlights faith abuse, weaponization and how perpetrators can manipulate faith as an act of violence, as well as withholding religious divorces, abuse relating to faith, which can amount to psychological or emotional abuse and to coercive and controlling behavior. We also had a po policy briefing last year on raising the legal age of marriage, uh, where we highlighted that decision makers and policy makers needed to allocate resources to educate faith and community leaders. Uh, religious and community leaders needed to be heavily engaged and play a vital role in safeguarding women and girls and protecting them against marriage under 18 years old, for under 18 years old. And we also highlighted the collaborative work which needs to be done with representative for buy and for organization. Our Keeping the Faith, What Survivors from Faith Communities Want Us to Know highlighted women of faith, what women of faith want government and faith and communities to know, something which is missed out when we have conversations around in a Vogue sector uh, with experiences of uh, black and monetized and women of faith communities really. We also provided recommendation and worked with other organizations around Vogue sector on principles of online safety bill and as well as worked with e coalition on the joint law commissioning provided a response on intimate image abuse. And that brings me to the next question really for us to renumerate and reflect as well why this webinar. We are very proud to be in partnership and working collaboratively with other partners, as well as with Project Dildal. Dildal means T, uh, me, means bridge in T, T in ground, a term that reflects the project's aim of bridging different principles and sectors in order to achieve a more reflective decolonial integrated approach to addressing domestic abuse in faith communities internationally. Standing together in search of excellence report uh, highlighted again uh, that service providers within domestic abuse and Vogue sector have often adopted policies, prior priorities or strategies of empowerment that often ignore or wholly disregard the intersecting needs of black and marginalized women. The launch of anti-racist charter in Vogue sector again emphasized the unequal power dynamics in Vogue sector challenging the unequal partnerships and power dynamics that systematically and uh, dis, uh, 
disadvantage by and for organizations and black and minoritized women working in the sector. Compounding to that already challenges we have, the government policies we know have, have, harm, have a harmful impact on certain policies and legislation proposals uh, on black and minoritized migrant and marginalized victims and survivors of abuse. The government recently introduced and passed a number of pieces of legislation that pose risk to women's rights and exacerbate inequalities that prevent marginalized women from seeking protection and support. Among the many, many a few to mention is the National Nationality and Borders Bill, uh, Borders Act, the British Bill of Rights, which again is a smokescreen for scrapping human rights acts. There needs to be equal and effective access to protection and support for all women, regardless of their immigration status, especially important in the context of Istanbul Convention reservations. Finally, we hope this will be a beginning and this conversation will be an ongoing conversation, learning and reflection to improve uh, Vogue sector, creating a space, hopefully rethinking, reframing and reconstructing models and thinking beyond mm -hmm. Eurocentric models in supporting survivors and working with perpetrators. Uh, we and know that the models are not working sometimes and it would be really good to have those ongoing conversations about how we go beyond and dismantle that and remodel and shape uh, for our, in, in, in an end you were to share best practices really. So thank, thank you, you so Asifa. much. Thank you, that was really, really helpful uh, for giving us a introduction about phase in Vogue and also the highlights of why we're organizing this webinar. And as you mentioned, this is, uh, you know, it's uh, an open conversation to start the conversation uh, about decolonization because everyone, you know, it's very, very hot discussion at the moment. So we'll see, we learn from what we can learn. Our next speaker is, which I'm really looking forward to is Dr. Romina Sirati. And she's a fellow research, Pardon me, uh, Romina, and it, I know you will explain more about your background, so I'll leave it to you. Over to you, thank you. Sorry, I'm still trying to unmute myself. I've done this so many times and I still <laughs> have technical <laughs> challenges. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you so much. So I've shared my screen, I think, just to uh, make sure that you can see it and I will um, put it into presentation mode so that we do, don't lose any time. Thank you so much, Asif and Elsa and Zahra and everyone, the Faith and Vow Coalition for organizing this and allowing us to work on this collaboratively. Uh, just to say that, uh, you know, we have been having conversations with Elsa and Asifa for a very long, very long time uh, on, on doing something like this. Project Doldal is dedicated to applying a decolonial approach uh, that we aspire to, whether we are effective or not, and, and the challenges we are facing is, is open to discussion, uh, but I will, I will briefly refer to that as well um, uh, later in my presentation. Uh, I, what we discussed with Elsa is that it would be good for me to perhaps uh, frame the conversation by offering some insights on how decolonization has been discussed, the critiques that have been raised perhaps, uh, more widely around, uh, uh, you know, this, the sectors of international development, public health, um, humanitarian responses, because these deal with VAUG and GBV in, in internationally, uh, and and also to um, to see to, to reflect on some of the critiques that have been raised specifically in relation to the VAUG sector, and reflect or or pose some questions that we can reflect on today. Um, pr primarily for our presenters, but also for our audience, uh, so that you can uh, join later in the Q&A and share your own experiential knowledge and thoughts, uh, reflecting on those questions together. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say, this is a very brief agenda of, of my session, I'll try to keep it as short as I can, also trying to speak slowly uh, because I'm, I'm aware of the, of the, of the sign experts uh, that I shouldn't rush. Um, I'd like to first say a word on my positionality and then offer a, 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 a very reflective presentation on the world system we are part of, the inequalities that comprise this system, uh, and some of the, of the problematic implications for uh, the VAUG sector uh, for responding to uh, violence against women internationally, what that means, uh, and also reflect on, uh, perhaps provide some questions that we can ask in an effort 
to apply decolonial lens or decolonial reflexivity to our practices uh, within uh, violence against women or gender-based violence work. And then just briefly to mention the approach of Project Dildal, which responds to this system. As I said, it's an aspirational model. Uh, we have a, a hard work to do to, to, be, to be able to say that it, it's working, but uh, it, it is a response. It was designed in response to this problematic system. Uh, I, the first thing I'd like to say is like, uh, is that I'm, I'm certainly not the most appropriate to speak on the question of decolonization. Uh, decolonization uh, and discourses around decolonization start with decolonization, physical decolonization movements in the former colonized uh, uh, areas of the world. Uh, it, I think anyone from communities that have uh, experienced colonization would be most best position to, to speak on decolonization. But what I wanted to say is that, um, you know, positionality is truly key in this in this conversation. Uh, it really depends on where one is coming from, the history of one's nation, one's uh, personal life, uh, that will determine also the way we approach this question. Uh, so it's very likely that all of us will have different understandings. Uh, we don't need to agree. There isn't a, uh, in my experience, uh, an agreed definition or a right way or a wrong way of understanding this uh, concept. Uh, and, and as you all know, it's oftentimes overused. It's oftentimes appropriated from uh, within the system to continue colonial practices, uh, what many might call neocolonialism. Uh, so we have to be aware that the concept itself is not a panacea, is not a remedy, is not a solution. What is important is that uh, the, the ethos that deco the decolonization movement started from former colonized peoples and um, indigenous communities it, it is, it's, it, you know, it's the ethos that we need to understand and embody. And, and this is what I aim at um, to, um, to emphasize in my presentation today. Um, in terms of my positionality, I have worked for about uh, 17, uh, sorry, 10 years now, uh, since 2012, I'd say more or less on uh, international development, working with communities primarily in sub-Saharan Africa, to desecularize and diversify the international development sector. I came to this decolonization uh, effort and, act, and, and activism, I'd say. I wouldn't call myself a researcher or an academic. I sit at SOAS University of London, uh, but I, I currently work with communities based in Ethiopia, uh, and, and I always try to be uh, as, as much as possible connected to the communities um, to do practical active work. Uh, but I come from this because I saw very early on in my career the misrepresentations and the very monolithic West-centric re representations uh, in the international development sector about African countries, about low and middle income countries. I was born in Moldova, another low and middle income country, and my country was represented, tended to be represented in negative ways as backwards and so forth. And I just, it just, that, that spoke to me and I related to the, to the concerns that my African colleagues were raising, uh, you know, in the various countries that I've worked in. Um, so, so to me, it has a personal value, uh, but I come to it primarily from an epistemological point of view, uh, trying to decolonize the concepts and the theories we use in the disciplines I work with. So I work primarily at the intersection uh, of gender, religious, and development studies, and my own work is dedicated to uh, kind of sensitizing theory making to the experiential knowledge of communities so that not only we understand gender related issues and specifically domestic violence that I have a stake, uh, you know, I have a personal experience in and dedication to address um, through the conceptual repertoires of the communities, through their own understandings, through their own imaginary um, but also to respond to these issues in ways that make sense to the communities. And they're not West-centric, they're not imposed from the outside to the best of, of, of you know, to, to the extent that it, it is possible. Uh, and the, the second aim is to reverse the knowledge transfer, which historically has been from the West to the rest uh, in very simple terms, or Northern countries to Southern countries. Uh, and, and really, uh, you know, promote a model of knowledge production that is equitable, that, that truly values the experiential knowledge of communities. Um, I won't say much. I think you can look uh, about my background uh, later on. It's not that important. But what I wanted to, to start with is a representation of the unequal system that we are part of, as I understand it. Um, and as I think uh, many decolonial uh, and postcolonial critics have pointed to and raised, uh, and I think this system is um, 
uh, you know, the, 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 the colonialism today continues through a system that has multiple facets. One is epistemological. So uh, the dominance of Western knowledge continues, uh, sorry, of Northern societies and Western societies continues through knowledge production. The concepts we apply, the theories we apply, uh, the way we analyze problems and try to resolve them oftentimes are informed by uh, Western epistemology. Uh, so that is the system of knowledge production and validation that dominates in Western societies and academia. Uh, and they gen generally have dictated theory and paradigms also in the VAUX sector, which I, I, will, I will discuss very, very shortly. Uh, the other aspect is ideological. So this dominance continues through political agendas and ideological agendas uh, that might be considered global or international, but in fact, uh, they are decided within spaces where northern countries tend to have uh, more power and are disproportionately uh, their interests are di disproportionately represented many people are marginalized or not part of these conversations uh, and so it's really important to understand that um, ideological uh, processes are in place that are also very unequal and those are then kind of transposed internationally with implications for um, non-western communities and then the other side of it is material and structural. Uh, it, the, the dominance of Western countries and this inequitable uh, system of knowledge production continues also through funding structures because to a large extent funders decide what the priorities for research should be or uh, donors more broadly in practical sectors decide what kind of programs or interventions should be funded. Uh, and then also decide the measures of success and the measures of, of um, the ways of measuring outcomes and outputs and what kind of outcomes and outputs to value. I'm sure you're all familiar with log frames, theories of change and uh, results-based uh, interventions that funders prefer. But of course, these kind of preferences have implications for what kind of knowledge and what kind of outputs and impact is being favored and what kind of impact is over overlooked. Uh, I just wanted to define very briefly the word epistemology. Uh, it's a term that we use a lot in academia, and I understand that our audiences are not necessarily within that sector. Uh, I'd like to quote Gloria Latson Billings, a very well-known uh, critical race theorist uh, based in the US who noted that epistemology is ultimately linked to worldviews. Uh, and that really means that, you know, we are all epistemologically situated. We, we all belong to a system of knowledge production uh, that is ultimately decided by the belief system and our context of socialization. Uh, in essence, the way uh, we are socialized, the way we have been educated, the system in which we have been educated will determine the way we theorize, uh, the way we engage with other peoples, with other cultures, with other religious systems. And of course, that means that we are all predisposed in certain directions, whether positive or negative, when we engage with the world. Uh, so really being aware of our epistemological situatedness, that we are all uh, epistemologically situated and therefore somehow limited in our understanding of the world is, is, a, is a starting point in developing a decolonial ethos uh, and approach. Um, historically, uh, I, I'd like to reference Franz Fanon uh, from Martinique, the, the, the well-known psychologist and Kenyan writer Nugugi Wotyongo, who have evidently demonstrated through their works how Western European colonizers projected their worldviews and understandings on, of humanity onto the other, dehumanizing the colonized subjects as they, as they, as they, uh, the, the terminology that they use, um, which of course define knowledge production in those times and the way these other peoples were represented, other religions were represented, other cultures were represented. But these projections and assumptions still underpin much scientific research because the way that we make knowledge, the way we validate knowledge, uh, and some of the assumptions and theory theories that we still use and concepts uh, have not been decolonized by these biased perceptions and, and um, generalizations. And of course, it also continues because a lot of the people who make theory and write, but also who are in the practice sector, are not aware of our own epistemological baggage, right? We're not reflective of our own assumptions, uh, and it takes some time for us to be able to reflect in depth uh, of our limitations and how we engage with the world. Uh, uh, to quote Ngugi Wotyongo, if you're not familiar with his work, I think this is really, um, it's important to read the works of decolonial thinkers and post-colonial thinkers, um, quote, um, let me just close this, apologies. It's most important area of domination, so this is referring to colonialism, was the mental universe of the colonized, 
the control through culture of how people perceive themselves and their relationship to the world. Um, so here, uh, the author essentially uh, refers to the fact that this colonization was not just physical, it was mental, it was cultural, it was holistic, comprehensive, uh, and it really uh, defined how people themselves understood their own humanity, uh, very damaging to the core. Um, I'd like now to move very quickly to critiques of our sector, just to frame the conversation and the presentations that will follow. I won't go in detail. Uh, this, this present, the presentation will be made available. So I'll just highlight the fact that the critiques have been both about around the way we make knowledge in the VAUC sector, the concepts we use, the way we understand vi uh, violence, the way violence is being defined, let's say in the UK context, um, the way gender-based violence is theorized. Uh, these theories, again, oftentimes have been, well, historically have been very much influenced by the uh, feminist movement in northern countries, and some of their, their assumptions are not, do, do not necessarily apply or reflect uh, the realities of women around the world. Uh, they have also been criticized, or there's have, there has been a lot of problematization around what kind of approaches should we be using in the VAUC sector to respond to uh, violence against women, gender-based violence, domestic violence, in ways that are reflective of the cultural diversity in the world and, and, and respect the different religious cultural systems uh, of, of these communities uh, in a way that doesn't alienate the communities, but makes them part of the process of a part of the response, part of the change process uh, where that's necessary. Uh, and uh, more specific to you, to the context of many of, uh, in the audience, because you work in organizations, as far as I could tell, um, there has been a lot of pro problematization of whether VAL providers and practitioners are sensitive to, to the diversity of their clients, to their cultural backgrounds, to their religious beliefs, uh, and whether in their service provision, they're reflecting on their own uh, the legacies of, you know, the biases that they might have because of their position in the mainstream, in a Western epistemological framework. And finally, to pay, uh, you know, kudos to the anti-racism uh, charter, a lot has been said about uh, funding inequalities, inequalities in funding, lack of funding continuity that disadvantages Black and minoritized uh, organizations and groups, racism in the VAUC sector, uh, and I'm not here to define it, I think it's upon the speakers uh, after me to define this, uh, patronizing attitudes towards Black and minority organizations, appropriation of knowledge that Black and minority uh, organizations have by white mainstream organizations, uh, lack of attribution and crediting. So all these issues that the anti-racism charter has raised are very salient, and I think uh, most of our members here today can relate to those issues. So what I want to say and, and finish with uh, before I just briefly say something about Project Del Del is to pose a few questions uh, to all of us, uh, some inward and some outward looking questions uh, in an effort to move towards this, um, I guess, cultivation of a decolonial reflexivity for a lack of phrasing it in a better way. Um, so I would start first with the knowledge we use, you know, what theoretical frameworks and whose knowledge do we use to understand violence, culture, religion, or other realms of life that are salient in the experience of VAUG? Do we privilege experience-based knowledge or theories? Uh, do we have evidence that a theory works in a certain context, or we just assume that it's valid because it's a Western theory or an influential theory? Are we considerate of differences in how people experience violence? Uh, do we recognize that our understanding might not reflect their understanding? Uh, do we reflect in how, how our own identities determine how our clients respond to us? Uh, maybe we have some differences uh, that we need to be aware of and how and we need to, to manage those differences in our relationships. Uh, are we aware of our own cultural baggage, right, to put it very simply, in the work we do? Um, do we, or do we think that we are highly professional or technocratic and therefore, uh, you know, uh, you know, we, we have no biases, which, which I'd say is, is, is a very problematic assumption to make. Uh, are we trying to apply an intersectional lens, as Asifa mentioned, and what does intersectionality mean in our work? Uh, what does racism or racializing or discriminating mean to us and others? Um, and how do we uh, ensure that the processes we implement respond to these problematic behaviors, right? Uh, and then how do we work with communities, organizations, or other stakeholders? Are we considerate of, pow considerate of power inequalities? 
Uh, do we understand how to be inclusive and what that means in each context? Uh, and then a few more on organizational uh, uh, collaboration and, and teamwork, really, because, it, you know, decolonization starts within the organization and then uh, it extends to the communities we engage with, right, and the clients we engage with. What is the composition of the organization? How are people recruited? Is there a representation of diverse groups and backgrounds and stakeholders? Uh, really, how do we understand diversity, another term that has been overused? Um, and how do we yet try to apply, let's say, diversity in the way we communicate with different people? Uh, some people might communicate well in writing. Some people might communicate well orally. Is that part of our modus operandi within the organization? How are work responsibilities, rewards, and opportunities distributed? Uh, are certain individuals favored over the others consistently and why? Do we properly attribute the work of everyone in the organization, uh, especially what we consider low ranking stuff? Uh, and I, I think that that's probably a problematic way of thinking of, of the organizational structure. Um, do we credit the contributions of black and minority staff members as much as we credit the work of members uh, of, from the white majority? And how do we implement collaborative work? Uh, how do we work with others in the team? Is there respect? Is there shared learning, equal contribution? Uh, or are there hierarchies that still need to be considered and responded to? Uh, and and uh, in terms of cultural baggage, I just wanted to note the argument that many might make, and you might have heard of, uh, that you know, if, a, if an organization is highly professional or technical, they're not cultural. Uh, that's a misperception because everyone is socialized in a certain context. Uh, and everyone is cultural, and that we cannot avoid. Uh, subjectivity is part of, uh, of the work we do. We do our work within our bodies and within our minds that are biased in certain ways. Um, so I'd say that decolonizing cannot be done you know, in any objective manner uh, by some measures of professionalism, but it really is a matter of recognizing our subjectivity in our engagements with the world uh, and reflecting you know, how our subjectivity then limits us and, and you know, maybe the, the, the strengths it brings, but also the limitations and how we can then manage those limitations. Um, project Dildo is a project that responds to this system. We have a website and I encourage you to look, look it up. Uh, I know Elsa, yeah, just the final <laughs> point. <laughs> Thank you. Just to say that um, it's, it's not a remedy. It's not uh, uh, you know, the only way to respond to this system. Uh, but it's really, uh, you know, an effort to depart from these preconceptions of violence, uh, to really work with communities to conduct research, to create opportunities for all members, uh, you know, being aware of these different dynamics and, and difference of opportunities, uh, and really move towards a model of mutual learning and, and equal, you know, knowledge exchange where everyone is valued, everyone's perspective is valued. And I think this event today is about that. Thank you so much, Elsa. Pass thank you, Romina. It was really, really insightful. And thank you for providing us, you know, what we needed. Before we move to Sahin, our next speaker, could I just remind all uh, the speakers to speak in a slow pace and might be mindful about uh, our BSL interpreters so they can catch up with us? Uh, and I'll move on to Sehen. Sehen is, uh, Sehen Tafara is the founder of the Setawit movement based in Ethiopia. Setawit means feminist in, in Amharic, uh, but I should give us more insight on this. And uh, Sehen studied her, did her PhD on gender studies with SOAS, and she's a mother of Rekha in Liban. Mm -hmm. And she's committed on sorry, feminist I, also, also, I didn't catch the PhD in. Oh, sorry, a PhD in gender studies from SOAS. Oh, uh, so, uh, soon over to you. Uh, like, you know, we heard a lot about the academic version of explanation about decolonization. Now we're going to look at the practical examples of what it means on day-to-day -day routines when buy and for organizations provide support to end violence against women and girls. So I'll leave it to you, Sehen. Thank you. Okay. Great, thanks so much, Elsa. Um, can everybody see my presentation? I'm not, I'm not very good at, uh, at this. Can you, see, are you able to see it, Elsa? Yes, I can see two beautiful children. Uh, no, screen. you shouldn't see my children, no. Um, do you see my presentation? The presentation? No, no. Um, oh, I haven't. Have I not shared it? Okay. Um, 
if you stop sharing and you share the presentation rather than your desktop, uh, it will give you a window. You can share your yeah. windows. Okay. Share screen. Now, can you see it? No, it's still the same. So I'll try uh, from my side. But... Yes. No, I'm. I'm sorry about that. I haven't. I haven't done this before. Um, but just in the interest of time, um, I'll start with a little bit of an introduction. Um, so thank you so much to the uh, VAUG and Faith Coalition and, and the DILDO project for this really interesting um, conversation, much needed, I think, um, and excellent presentations by Romina and Asifa. So um, to just tell you a little bit about Seitawit, uh, it's a feminist network that we um, that really began in a very informal manner in 2014 as a circle of women getting together to to discuss um, sexual violence issues that was always kind of the core of of what we do uh, thank you all right so that's back um and that's grown to do more uh, proper programmatic work um, and our focus is uh, gender-based violence and we have a three-pronged approach on gender-based violence uh, so i'll talk a little bit about that and also of course movement building uh, we're not the first feminist movement in ethiopia but uh, we're focused to building a pathway for there to be a mass-based movement um, in the near future so that's about Seitawit, um, and you can find more information on www.seitawit.com. Um, so gender-based violence um, for us, um, again, three-pronged approach. Um, a big part of what we do is obviously campaigning, um, creating information um, on sexual-based violence, um, even concepts clarifying what do we mean by gender-based violence um, and viol violence against women and girls. That's not a term we use usually. We prefer gender-based violence because there's a lot of violence against uh, men and boys as well, and, um, and numbers are rising in Ethiopia. Um, so that's the, the campaigns that we do. Uh, we've had several of those and now we're correct. We're um, also working on um, highlighting the violence. Um, that's been a major, a major aspect of um, the conflicts um, in Ethiopia that, that you're all aware of. So that's, that's something we're engaging on. Um, and um, the secondly, we're working with um, partners on um, kind of calling for uh, an end an end for an end to the conflict which is which has just been uh, restarted um, unfortunately another part aspect of our work is the data data collection work we work with the police with that Ababa police commission on this um, because we have major issues around um, data collection um, we don't actually know the prevalence of violence in Ethiopia because our data collection system is so weak um, so that's something we're working on uh, and a third aspect of our gender-based violence work is um, services for violence survivors. We run Al Alenta, which is a um, hotline, it's a free hotline for sexual violence survivors, uh, one of the first in Ethiopia. Um, so that's, that's direct services. Um, and of course, referral and uh, frontline counseling um, on, on the hotline. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a free hotline that's... Uh, that that you that uh, callers can use um, from Monday to Saturday, anytime. So that's it's 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 going really well. It's it's, it's a new project for us. It's been about uh, three years now, uh, but that's something we're happy with. So in terms of movement building, um, can someone help me with the slides? Do I just slide them down? Okay. So um, I can do it. Just let me know. Yeah, so go ahead, Elsa, please. Yeah, so this is, uh, in terms of movement building, we work with married girls um, in Amhara region where the median age of marriage is, is 15. Uh, so we have, a we have circles, we have 16 circles actually, comprised of 250 uh, girls who are married between the ages of 10 and 14. Um, and we do a lot of empowerment for work with them. There's an economic empowerment component so that's something that's something else we do. Um, this is this is mostly in the northern part of the country. Next slide, please, Elsa. 
Um, and as I mentioned, um, in terms of gender-based violence, uh, it's just a series of campaigns. So all these names are in Amharic. Um, another, yeah, yeah. So this is uh, an example of the mural art we have promoting some of our campaigns on sexual violence. Um, this is Lekaidalam, or it's not right, um, and it conceptualizes um, sexual violence. So uh, what we have written there is, um, and this is an advert for, um, <clears throat> for our hotline. No, it's fine. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, these are just pictures, and some. OK, so coming to the topic, um, decoloniality and um, the violence against women and girls or gender-based violence sector, I've been thinking a lot about this since um, Romina asked me asked me to present a, a few a few weeks back or, or a few couple of months back. Um, so decoloniality um, is um, or the process of decolonization is, is definitely a consideration in our efforts um, to articulate an Ethiopian brand of feminism. Uh, we're definitely a member or uh, part of a key um, part of um, the, the decolonization effort of African feminism, um, obviously. Um, we're quite pan-African in our view, and um, decolonization is, is definitely a part of that. Um, but we do it almost subconsciously, so it's, it's really important, uh, and conversations like this really help us be a little bit more conscious in our efforts. Um, so, so this is very useful for us. Um, we're part of a loose network of African feminists. Um, there's a group based in Uganda, SIHA, that we're members of. Um, and we have learning sessions with other groups in, in Uganda and other places. Um, but obviously, this could be a lot stronger. Uh, we could be doing so much more in, in terms of integrity or integration uh, with with African feminists and with other brands of African feminism. But it's definitely something that's that's interesting or that's important for us to do. Uh, we're completely intersectional in our approach, uh, working with um, particularly um, groups serving women um, with disabilities is, is an important part of our work. And I'm very happy to see that um, there's sign language interpretation on this webinar. Uh, we always have um, sign language interpretation or um, interpretation for for other groups uh, on all our work, um, and um, that's something that we 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 will see grow in the next um, three to years, three to five years as well. So, in terms of decolonization, um, it's almost like a, a reflex kind of defense mechanism because there's so much. Um, there's so much resistance and really so much uh, backlash against feminism in Ethiopia because it's really seen as this Western import. Um, so our response is uh, really kind of, uh, it's almost existential for us to, to try to show that um, this, is, this is an Ethiopian, Ethiopian feminism and it's rooted in, in, in African values and in, in Ethiopian values in particular. Um, and of course, as you know, the colonial efforts are not new in Africa. Ethiopia is a little bit late to the to the game, I think, um, and that's really ironic because we really pride ourselves on never having been colonized, and yet um, uh, we're quite slow on the kind of the decolonial uh, aspects aspects of the work. Um, but in terms of Ethiopian feminism in particular, we're completely rooted in in historical precedents. Um, so for example, Ikake Wardot was a, a feminist from the 18th century uh, who took her community to court over um, her rights uh, to not allow her husband to have a, a third wife. Um, so that kind of things. Um, and Zara Yaakob is, is an Ethiopian philosopher who was the contemporary of uh, people like Descartes. Um, and he was talking about really what we understand as, as kind of the, pre, the percepts or kind of the really the genesis of Ethiopian feminism. He was talking about women and men being equal um, and that um, women should be allowed to go to church even when they're menstruating and all these kind of really radical ideas. Uh, he was writing about them before anybody in the West had, had um, decided to talk about feminism. So we root all our practice and all our inspiration um, from these kind of efforts and from these kind of conversations. However, um, I'd like to come back to some of the points raised by Romina. Um, it's actually really, really hard um, to bring decoloniality to your everyday workplace. Um, we have it in theory for sure. Uh, but it's, it's actually quite hard because even little things, even um, 
simple things like, well, you know, we should be using Ethiopian time or we should be using the Ethiopian calendar. Uh, we should be using Amharic or Afan Oromo, which is our second uh, working language and, and our communication. Um, but we're all so trained to, to think and to work in English that it becomes a default. And we, we just end up confusing everyone. You know, we issue statements that we will have such and such meeting, Ethiopian time, and everybody still thinks we're, we're using Western time. So it's, 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 um, it's harder than it, than it seems. Um, and it's, um, I don't think it's impossible, but it's actually, it takes a lot of, a lot of work and, and um, feminist praxis, um, as Romina was saying. So I'm, I'm completely um, with her on, on what this means in effect. And we say this being a completely Ethiopian group. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's something to think about how, how colonization works in, in, in our minds. Next slide, please, Elsa. Um, so this is, these are just a couple of, a couple of pictures. Um, illustrating what I'm talking about in terms of Ethiopian, Ethiopian feminism. Um, so that's, it's, um, anyway, fine, sorry, go ahead. Uh, a couple of slides back, please. Next slide. All right, this is great, thank you. So again, um, in relationship to donors, which is obviously a site of, of politics and a site of power, uh, that's something to think about. Uh, there's definitely racial issues there. Um, I, I think it would be very dishonest to say that there aren't. Um, and, and our challenge is to do nonprofit work, to do development. We don't do development work, but we do aid work um, without sounding like a nonprofit because there's so much cynicism and resistance um, in Ethiopia to outsiders who try to work on any social change issues in Ethiopia. Um, so decolonizing our relations with partners, again, as Romina said, uh, you know, questioning hierarchies, uh, what we consider, what I think of as low-key racism, uh, you know, always this element of um, kind of uh, being condescending, um, international versus local consultants, uh, sometimes relationships can be a little bit passive aggressive. So all of that is, is um, our, our issues to consider when we're decolonizing, not just our work, but, but the, the sector in general. Uh, particularly at this time, it's, it's a very tense time in Ethiopia, and international actors are, are seen with are um, looked at with, with a lot of suspicion and um, dislike, to be honest. So it's it's quite tricky for us. Um, so some of these reflections have been academic, um, but a lot of them are uh, are actually more uh, more practical uh, based on based on our experience. So I think I'm almost out of time anyway. Um, I'll stop there and happy to take questions or comments. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Sahin. That was really, really uh, following what Romina was uh, explaining to us to hear that it really means in day to day life of feminist movement, uh, especially, you know, I found it very interesting when you talked about the calendar and the timing and how confusing it is. And it starts from basic things like that. So thank you for highlighting that. Uh, please, if you have any questions, put it, uh, don't make sure to put it on the question and answer. So we can go back to it um, later on. Uh, we move on to our other really lovely speaker, Mebrak Gabrawelzi. Um, sorry, that's my timer. <laughs> uh, Mebrak uh, is a founder of Diversity Resource International. She's uh, an Eritrean British diaspora who lived in the UK for many years, but I know she her heart is in both places and because she set up quite a few organizations in Eritrea and in the UK. Um, Mebrak's background is about research, facilitation, and business startup, so her practical experience will reflect on that, and she will give us a highlight of some of the obstacles fine for organizations in the UK face uh, when it comes to decolonization. So over to you, Mebrak. Thank you for uh, being speaking one hour here. Thank you very much, and thank you for the speakers uh, before me. <clears throat> I will share Hold on a second. I'll share my screen. Did you allow me to, to share? Go for it. If not, I have it here. I think I can share. I'll just share first what DRI, you know, Diversity Resource International, a UK-based um, 
uh, social enterprise community interest does. Um, it's set up to support migrants and ethnic minorities in Sussex in 2004. Um, we are four directors, uh, all of us descendant from the African continent. And um, we just um, built this last year through the pandemic to just articulate what it is that we want to do and how we might be able to achieve them. So community development is our core activity and community research and also leadership and enterprise and training towards equity and inclusion. Because over the years, these are what we see um, as gaps, which I will talk in my um, second um, presentation. So uh, let me just go to share again. So, um, as you know, I think Elsa introduced me very well, so I don't need to introduce myself. Thank you very much. Uh, this is from my own experience, but also from the small community research that we do from our partners, which is the um, health partners in Sussex and the local authorities. And it's all about access to services, um, equity through uh, opportunity of employment, further education, and so on and so on. So. I see this from both sides, you know, going to Eritrea and also I go to Ethiopia as well. I travel to other countries in Africa and I find it, they both correlate. Um, the challenge that we see in those countries, we see it here with the migrants and ethnic minorities as well. But <clears throat> I will be concentrating on what it is that we see here. I think what we see here is, um, that uh, over 25 years in Sussex, um, we see that the overarching narrative is if you are from the low income, if you can't articulate yourself, if you have housing problems, you simply don't get or don't access health, social care and employment as your other communities or the communities whom English is their first language or your white. Um, counterparts. So again and again, that is confirmed. And unfortunately, most of the ethnic minority individuals, ethnic minority led organizations, they are in this category. And, you know, it's not, I'm not telling you something new. I'm sure you've heard of this uh, for many years, but as a small um, uh, research and community development center, that's what we see um, and experience. So how did this manifest itself is that I think it manifests itself from, you know, lack of cultural and historical competency when you go to organizations and try to access health, try to access employment uh, and media branding also, media branding of communities, of nations and race that attributed to unconscious bias and also conditioned, you know, a lot of uh, um, branding from the media. You know, if, you, if we talk about Africa, for example, even those projects that intended to support, intended to help the communities, they become a branding of Africa. Um, uh, I, I walk on the streets and, and, and the minute I say that, you know, I am from Eritrea, forgetting the whole Eritrean community say, oh, has the war stopped? Oh, you know, we have always conflict and so on and so on. Um, they, don't, they don't ask me, oh, you know, women was powerful and women have, uh, you know, 32% uh, of women were participating in the, in, the, in the freedom struggle. What is that? How about that? So I think the media, the Western media just present, um, communities and nations and races so, you know, in a negative way, whoever is conditioned by that without knowing probably they reflect that when you go to have services as well. And also the history of colonization, slavery, poverty, war, conflict, migration, if you presented in that way in everywhere, and if there is no curriculum to teach you the other, if you haven't been given a platform to tell the other narrative, then that's your name. 
So, um, and, and uh, yeah, um, that's what we see, that's what we experience um, in, in the UK. Um, also, the induction system in the UK for new migrants is very poor. There is no proper induction for people to have a, a stepping stone to um, go to you know, education, speak very good English, bilingual advocacy, outreach support. You know, you come here and sometimes people just don't know whether they are have the residency or the leave to remain for 10, 9, 7 years. Imagine a person come, you know, at 18 to end up with no permission to work, no permission to go for education for 10 years. That is 28. So um and 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 this has happened, you know, and, and there are a lot of people that uh, with that kind of experience. And there is always assumptions made about the impact of cultural differences, making people, you know, if you just, some people don't know that Africa has 54 countries. So, so long you are black, you're African, and um, you understand everything about African cultures. So that lumping together um, uh, is, is, is also not, um, not helping communities to go forward. Um, so this is from the research, but what do the communities, for example, in Sussex tell us? This is what they tell us, that there is always, you know, there is racism in UK organizations, um, whether it's underground, or it, whether it's covered by something, but there is racism, there is a problem with color um, in, in the UK. Uh, and I think what they're asking is just to have, you know, a, a respect and, and and being valued and and their and their their knowledge, their ethnicity, uh, to be taken as an advantage, not as a liability, because there is a lot of richness within the diversity contribution and so on and so on. So to to conclude. What we find here is that if we go in to go forward, um, a long-term community engagement, including what we're talking, violence against women and girls, it, it won't change overnight. It, it has to have a very long time process to really um, engage with the communities, engage with the religious leaders, engage with the community leaders, engage with women themselves. That takes time. And the funding in the UK is on and off. It's just like a tap. You know, you can have for six months and then that's it. Six months, you can't even introduce yourself to the communities so that they can trust you. But also I think that kind of um, stereotype thing that um, religion and culture in fact is our our strengths, you know, I come from Eritrea where religion and culture is a way of life. Within that, there is a gap and nobody can deny that there is a gap, but you have to see, you know, I, I do leadership and management program and we use the, the, the model called fishbone. The fishbone is if there is one fish, you know, or, or one part of the fish is unwell, the whole body is unwell. So you can't just take one thing from the whole society, such as you know, violence against women and, 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 and gender and, and girls, or you can't say something out of the, you need to see the whole holistic um, yeah, society so that you can, you can see where is, which part of that body is not doing very well and how can we all uh, bring it to improve. Um, so to do that, you need a long-term funding. Diversity should be considered as a local, national, and global resources, not liability. Um, and, and lived and learned and the experience of those diverse communities should be really valued, shared, and not undermined. You know, uh, it surprised me when I see a lot of people become experts of the society that I come from. And I say, hold on a second. I know this society, I live with that. What you're telling me doesn't resonate with me. Um, 
So public organizations, academic institutions, um, commissioning and funding need to be inclusive. Um, and also awareness and education has to be mainstream. Children need to learn about history. Um, and also sustainability, the consumption and um, the, you know, is no equal between the South and the North. Uh, it's, it's just amazing. It's really amazing to see it myself, how the people in Eritrea live with a very small and how we live here. So I think in terms of decolonizing research, decolonizing education, all that, to me, it should come from those decolonized countries. Um, there is a lot of talk about it in the UK, but um, I doubt if those who have been you know, conditioned and been supported by colonization and went to colonize can bring about change in decolonizing. I think it has to be partners. It has to be partnership, but also to conclude it's time to listen for those countries, those nations, those communities. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mabrak. That is really, really, really uh, inspiring uh, talk, this discussion. Especially, I like the fact that you linked uh, the funding because Romina explained how funding is related to decolonialism. And it's really interesting to see how it's affecting specialist organizations like yours and, you know, the drop of here and there small grants. But so no sustainability of the work, the specialist work you're doing. So we really, really are grateful. Thank you so much. And we'll move on to our uh, last but not the least speaker, uh, Nana Otoyorte. Um, so Nana Otoyorte uh, has MB and she's an executive director of Forward. Uh, Forward is a leading African diaspora uh, women's rights organization who is leading on female genital mutilation campaign in the UK for many years. But and Nana has over 30 years experience of you know, championing gender equality. Uh, I know she's personally, you know, she's so passionate about young uh, women and girls issues in the UK and across Sub-Saharan Africa. Over to you, Nana. We look forward to hearing you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elsa. Uh, let me just share my slides and I know that uh, being the last person there is always the challenge of um, you know eating up your time etc so I just hope that uh, I will be able to uh, do justice I know you had asked me to talk about Vogue in general but I actually want to really looking at what has been uh, uh, said I, I just want to zero in on some of the implications in particular in relation to FGM so I really want to say a little bit about forward, clarify some of the issues, and for me, the meaning of decolonization, experiences of forward, and reflections really on some of the practical issues. So like you said, I don't want to go into much details. We're an African-led organization, um, really looking at multiple forms of abuse and not just FGM. But I want to focus today on FGM. I want to really say that we need to thank uh, the, the legacy of uh, George Floyd who has helped to highlight really the agenda of Black Lives Matter on this whole decolonization in relation to Vogue and related other issues. Whilst decolonization has been an issue for a very long time, we are very clear that the whole sad death and global you know, death of, of, of uh, George Floyd really brought more attention and we all started to piggyback a lot on these issues. So I really want us to really be clear about some of these things. So yes, we've heard there's been a history, but in the last two years, we've seen a lot more conversations and discussions around decolonization. I want to look at in terms of definitions, I'll talk about what is uh, been defined in the, um, sorry, the, the wave of Black Lives Matter protests around the world have brought into sharp focus the need to confront the ways in which Europe's colonial past shapes our collective present. Uh, calling for decolonization responds to the long overdue need for honest reflection, acknowledgement, and remedy for the legacy of empire across all facets of modern life, including within the UK aid sector. And this is part of the policy brief by the Gender and Development uh, uh, Briefing Paper Network. So you can actually uh, get it from their website. For me, decolonization is simply about restorative justice. It's about challenging biases 
unconscious or un uh, conscious or unconscious, challenging privileges and power at all levels in which we all operate. So zeroing in on FGM, I just really want to touch on. For me, the issues around FGM through a decolonizing uh, lens. FGM involves the removal of healthy female genitalia and is fueled by social norms. But FGM is also a form of vogue and recognized as child abuse in the UK. But we always see the othering of FGM in policy and funding. And so FGM is almost always seen as an exotic form of abuse. Female genital mutilation is seen differently from other forms of abuse. In the same UK, we are very clear that it is common to actually have uh, female genital um, surgeries, we call them cosmetic or designer uh, vaginas. Now, designer vaginas are purposely done because they are for non-medical reasons. So in the same way, they are not done for medical reasons. The social norms of designer vaginas and FGM are very similar. One is about altering the appearance of the vagina in different ways. We also recognize that um, just as FGM is harmful, um, cosmetic surgeries are also harmful. And the Royal College of Gynecology has actually shared some documents around it. I'm glad that the NHS is no longer uh, providing labia plastic, but it, it, it also provides guidance on how it's going to be done. And when we talk about these two issues, one is seen as, oh, um, women consent, because white women consent to do the same thing that black women have been doing for ages or African women have been doing for ages, but it's consent is done in private hospitals. It's police as not, you know, not the, the issue that we should prosecute because people consent. Well, people have the privilege and the power to consent to have designer vaginas, but for a lot of African girls and women, they don't have the power and privilege to consent. Or even if they consent, this is not accepted as consent. So there is the issue of the double standards and the othering of issues that affect black people or African women for that matter. And when we come to language and approaches, they also differ. So you see that uh, very often you hear in the news, FGM is barbaric, FGM is seen as archaic. Now tell me whether um, domestic violence is not barbaric. Tell me whether domestic violence is not harmful or whether domestic violence has nothing to do with culture. We all know that they are based on cultural norms that accept that women are less uh, 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 are unequal to men and that men have power over women. So we do so much in order to uh, support men. So when it comes to language, we almost always see that there are issues around language. When it comes to approaches on how we deal with FGM, the approaches almost always differ. And the same way that uh, you will see that in um, it's okay to um, provide support and services and make sure that these support and services are embedded. When it comes to tackling female genital mutilation in the UK, you'll find that support and services are very much contextualized, depending on the lottery and depending on where you live in the UK. And then I'd want to go directly into issues of the law and how the UK law treats FGM differently. So when we come to the law, we know that since 2015, um, a lot of us lobbied for uh, the laws on FGM to be tightened and strengthened because there were a lot of loopholes in it. But when we asked that it be done and we lobbied for it, it then became a serious crime. Now, when we talk about a serious crime, it actually means more serious than anything. And the element of making FGM a serious crime then also means that um, it has powers to pursue, disrupt, and bring to justice people involved in serious and organized crime and gun-related activity. That is the definition of a serious crime. So FGM has been made a serious crime in the UK since 2015. It has a lot of clauses, which is offense of failing to protect the girl from the risk of FGM. So parents can be prosecuted. Offense of failing to, uh, offense of uh, lifelong anonymity. That I found very interesting. Uh, so when a girl can testify in court that her parents took her through FGM, she can be protected. 
Um, those of us coming from our communities know that once a policeman comes to your door and knocks, everybody in the community knows. So when we talk about anonymity, what does it really mean? It really means nothing. We talk about, you know, female genital mutilation protective orders. That has been really, really crucial. So how long are these protective orders? Anybody can actually go ahead and say, I think this girl is going on holiday and she's going to have FGM. So I'm going to stop her from going on holiday and I'm going to take protective orders for this girl so that the parents will not take her to FGM. And it simply often doesn't require much evidence. All you want to say is the parents have been through FGM. We just suspect that this girl will be taken home for FGM. So all preparations and travel related are almost always stopped. So that girl is protected from FGM. Now we have the other one, which is the FGM mandatory reporting. So the mandatory reporting requires that professionals report, they have a duty to report, any girl who is seen to have uh, undergone FGM uh, at 18, uh, uh, below 18 years. And it's very much that the girl should herself indicate or the girl herself should, you should have um, inspected and found out that she's been through FGM. Technically, these laws should be reinforced through uh, training, support, and to get a good understanding within community. I'm so glad that Mebrak talked about community engagement and the need to really ensure that communities are the center. Now, I have stated clearly that FGM is a social norm. Unlike sexual abuse, where people do sexual abuse to gratify themselves, um, FGM is done primarily because communities feel that it's uh, to protect. Well, it's not really protective, is it? But at the end of the day, how can you stop FGM just by a law? you do need to engage communities and critically have conversations. So the issue of mandatory reporting, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the impact of the mandatory reporting. Uh, we did a, a study in Forward and some of the issues that came out. And from a police officer, he says, the mandatory reporting singles out FGM as a particular issue, which can be stigmatizing for a community. We should be looking at safeguarding as a whole and teaching professionals to spot the signs of any abuse within any family. So it's not just on FGM. And this is a police detective uh, who commented in the research. I'll also share something around uh, community women's perspective. I have three daughters and I'm dreading to get pregnant because of these uncomfortable questions to us mothers who of no fault of our own found ourselves cut. So typically women who would go into hospitals who are pregnant will be asked over and over and over again about FGM. Again, one said, when I had my daughter, when I had her in the hospital and stayed there for about five days, they kept talking to me about FGM until I went off. So for them, FGM is the only issue that affects the communities. And this then means that for a lot of women, their other needs are not addressed other than they come as a woman who has FGM and that's all they see about that woman. So for me, this is really challenging. I also want to uh, uh, look at, you know, some of the draconian policies that have also been done. And this includes the Operation Limelight. Operation Limelight was really seen as a way of protecting girls who have been through FGM. So what do we see is that when people are going on holiday, they will be stopped at airports and questioned, sometimes by the police. And I was told that they are questioned sensitively, which is really good. But that at the same time means you're pulled aside from your family, from your friends, and you're seen as different. So the othering of FGM almost always comes into place. And you will see even in the law and in other places uh, when we see FGM as very harmful. So it's so harmful, it's so dangerous that there needs to be a lot of policing to ensure that it's actually done and mainly visible policing at the airports. So we did a study and uh, called Do No Harm. And I'm really going to share some of the issues that came out of the study. So the communities feel persistent feeling of being suspected of wrongdoing, repeatedly being singled out and treated differently. They also talked about, uh, oh, what's happening? It's not coming through. 
significant toll on mental health and well-being, particularly for families. Because sometimes when the police visit the home, it's actually when parents are there, children are there, and it could be very traumatizing. There is no support for families who suffer because of FGM safeguarding. The women have to bear the consequences, even in a case where we had a forward, where a girl was taken into uh, protection because they thought that she had been through FGM. And that caused her so much trauma and illness, and there was no compensation and support. Damaged trust between professionals and diaspora communities is evident in the work that we even sometimes forward. We actually approach communities and we are fed up, you know, why are always talking about FGM and these issues? We don't want to really talk about FGM. So it then means that the whole element of protection gets thrown out of the window. The existing grassroots community organization, community engagement is also jeopardized in terms of our awareness raising work. So finally, I just like to uh, dwell on some perspectives that I feel we can address when dealing with FGM. So FGM is a crime and we should have zero tolerance to FGM, but all forms of uh, abuse to uh, and professionals should be trained adequately. We also encourage that uh, living a life free from harm is a human right and a requirement for health and well-being for all women and girls, including those affected by FGM. So the laws should act equally uh, apply. But we need to recognize that the othering makes it difficult for this to happen. Ending FGM requires coordinated approaches that should involve active involvement of affected communities. But what do we see? Piecemeal uh, funding, uh, you know, We've seen funding that is uh, siphoned more to big organizations, more generic organizations who never used to work on FGM suddenly become FGM experts and are giving all the funding and millions to be able to tackle FGM. Whilst organizations that have had a history and have built on knowledge and expertise are not given uh, the relevant support. Finally, we must also protect girls from FGM whilst enabling a supportive and safe environment free from harm, stigma and distress. We should do no, take on the do no harm principles. Over and over again, when it comes to FGM, we are asking for, you know, seeing horrific pictures of girls being pinned down, being cut, are things that we wouldn't do for other forms of abuse, primarily because FGM is the othering and it's okay to do anything when it comes to the other. Um, as we have a, a, a proverb in, 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 in uh, where I come from, Ghana, it says when it's in somebody else, it's not painful and it doesn't fit you. So that's really how FGM is almost always seen. And so I'd like to say thank you for uh, bringing me here on to share my little bits around FGM and how it can be seen from a decolonizing lens. Thank you so much for being part of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Nana. That was really, really, again, another inspiring uh, discussion about uh, decolonization. And also we talked about FGM specifically. You mentioned so many uh, areas of like about how barbarism is considered as barbarism when it's to do with issues affecting black uh, and minoritized ethnic uh, groups. And this is the major issue when we talk about trust and all sorts of issues that comes always goes with uh, the, what the other speakers say. I was going to ask you about your work in Africa, but that's another, a whole lot of a full day discussion. So we'll leave it to another day, I think. <laughs> uh, thank you so much everyone today for joining us for this really inspiring uh, webinar. I hope you agree with me that we learned so much from every one of our speakers and we're really uh, grateful that you're here. I don't see many uh, on the question and answers. There was a couple of things mentioned. One is from uh, Sadish from Sikh Women said, talking about how the local authority in West Midlands carried out the needs assessment by, required by the DA bill, domestic abuse bill, um, and how it concluded that, you know, having a buy-in for services would uh, risk black and minoritized communities. And because of that, they do not want to diverse vogue group is not required, not do not want, but is not required. So that's the conclusion. And we can see that from what you said, Mabrak uh, and also Nana, we can see that how this has deep impact in that specific local authority 
uh, let alone if we talk, you know, countrywide. Then if you have any comments to add on that, that would be really helpful. Because it shows that, you know, if they concluded, you know, Mabrak mentioned how your community trusted you and you know what it means, the specialist uh, service you're providing, what it means to your community and to the whole black and minoritized uh, communities in your area in, in Surrey. So if there is no funding and if the local authority believes that no specific funding is required for buy and for organization, this might have a big impact on your work day-to-day -day work, wouldn't it? Uh, I, I think, I don't think it's only on, you know, for DRI, I think it's general that um, ethnic minority-led organizations, obviously, you know, we have a passion, we have a, you know, connection. We came from those communities, so, you know, we want to um, support the international um, communities that came, come as migrants, international students, even those highly educated, by the way, they do struggle to find a job. So it's not just those that, you know, lack English or, you know, don't have. Uh, so I think the whole thing is that, um, to me, um, when you don't have, you know, if I'm talking about TRI's experience, all the directors, we are professional, that, you know, so we work and we get paid well. So in fact, we contribute 10% of our income to keep the organization going simply because we are committed to the, to the, to the, to the communities. One thing that it's, uh, you know, it's diversity is wealth, diversity is resources. And I think that's what we need to change, not just for, you know, local authorities, for private companies as well. Um, so I think to me, that mentality, it, it came, you know, it, it's, it's built up from historically, and I say that in my, in my presentation, you know, it's, it's the power. One race becomes so powerful, the, the Western, you know, um, countries become so powerful. And if I may say, I think it's about time, they, you know, this social structure that we created in the West cannot be sustainable. You cannot carry on on other countries' shoulder for resources, for everything, and not having a partnership and share resources equally. I don't know how long it's going to take, but I don't see sustainability into that. Because mm. you know what? Younger generation are coming to say enough is enough. So I think every organization, including universities, including corporate companies, have to respond to this new movement coming. We know we grow in the bananas and the coffees, but the result is on the other way. We're not taking advantage of it. And mm -hmm. I think we need to respond to it. It's fundamentally people are asking now, we don't have a problem with sharing, but let's share it properly. And all That's we're good. talking about, you know, other things is, is a byproduct. Yeah, that is really, really good point. Uh, Nana, do you have uh, comments? I, I just wanted to comment on this. I mean, follow on the con discussions on community engagement. At Forward, we have found the use of community champions as so, so critical to our community engagement work. And these community champions are uh, supported, trained uh, to be able to be the um, outreach, uh, 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 to do a lot of the outreach. You would find that these women come with a lot of assets. A lot of them will be educated, like uh, Mibrak has said, but they, they cost of maybe family situations and things, so they can work. However, most of this work is seen as voluntary. They do similar work to the whole called individual, uh, the independent domestic violence, you know, advocates kind of work. But on, on a different level, they are not paid. And so we are seeing that we are looking at structures which work at community level and are not compensated equally because they are community women. And so there are a lot of issues that we have to really zero in and look at and to explore how these are the foot soldiers who can actually make change happen because that professional will not be able to go and even have engagement. In reality, a lot of the professionals don't even know how to ask questions when it comes to women uh, on, on these issues around domestic uh, abuse. They are not even able to ask critical questions. So it's important that we explore 
what are the community assets and what are the community structures, uh, community uh, uh, things that have been put, strategies that have been put in place to make change happen? Because we want change to be on the ground and we need these to be adequately supported. So just something I just needed to add on. Thank you. Oh yes, that's really good. Thank you, Nana. So um, I think we covered, you know, we covered different areas, but what stand up to me is uh, the othering, decolonization means to stop othering communities and let's work together, appreciate the value, respect the value and uh, the value they can bring to the community. They are already contributing, as you, as you mentioned, Mabrak and Nana, is that, you know, the, it's not valued. So they do lots of unpaid work. They do lots of volunteering work, which is not generating income back. And they have to beg for a drop of funding from here and there. But we need to acknowledge and value what they are contributing to the community. And we are community as integrated community and no more othering. That's what I think for, from me. And if you have any more comments, we have a couple of minutes before, uh, I think actually one minute left. Um, but if there's anything you want to conclude in here, to add in here, uh, I would be very happy. Uh, Elsa, maybe a statement from Sahina. I just wonder uh, how the conversations we're having now in the UK relate to perhaps yes. your context in Ethiopia. I don't know. Sahina yes. would be nice to hear. Yes, and uh, over to you. Sure, yeah, no, everything everything definitely resonates. Um, although we only work in Ethiopia, I think the um, the othering, um, particularly the, what Nana was saying about FGM as kind of this um, othered violence, for example, in Ethiopia, the formal used, the term used for it is a harmful traditional practice. Uh, and I really reject this because it's violence. It's, it's violence just in the same way as domestic violence, and it's not any milder or... Mm -hmm something to put in a box um, so i completely agree with with all the points raised um and it's humbling for me to see that some of the challenges we see here um, um Mavrak and, and nana and and everybody else also faces working with immigrant communities um in the west so that's that's something that 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 i learned from this from this session so th thank you everyone it's been it's been really great Thank you. So I would like to conclude. This is just the beginning of ongoing conversation because we cannot end violence against women and girls without uh, acknowledging and appreciating what we've got in hand and bringing everyone on, to, on board. And this has been neglected for many, many years, but it's time now, as Mabrak said, this has to change. It has to stop and it has to be different for the next generation. And thank you for joining us. And I would like to highlight two things. One, we will share the recording and the slides with the feedback. So we will really appreciate if you feel the feedback and also you know, feel free to refer to the slides. And also I encourage you to look at our really two exciting events coming in September. We have an annual conference called Connecting Communities, which is really, really, you know, goes with the decolonization, our webinar today. So please look out to that on our website. And we also have, thanks to, COVID is not gone yet, but at least you know we can interact and meet in person. So we have an in-person networking on 23rd of September, and we look forward to seeing most of you. It's uh, open for everybody. Uh, Zara kindly is putting the links here, so please feel free uh, to join in. And thank you so much for, for BSL interpreters, Danny and Nikki, for stepping in at the last minute and for your brilliant work hard work. We really appreciate you. And thank you, everyone.